I've known Alan N. Simpson for just over 50 years. I grew up in Cody, Wyoming, near Al. Uh, I heard all the stories when I was a kid, and then I tried to do them myself uh, a few, few years later, and, and he helped me out of that hole. Um, I worked 18 years for Al, all 18 years. I was press secretary and then chief of staff, responsible for all mistakes. And um, <laughs> when Al went to uh, uh, retire and went to the uh, Harvard, I went to the Smithsonian and was in charge of government there for a while. Then my wonderful wife, Rebecca, who was right here. I'm telling you, I could not have done this book without Rebecca. Uh, she did, uh, she proved and she researched and she put up with me being up at four o'clock in the morning and she is amazing. So we were uh, tired, went overseas and did a bunch of work with charities and children and blind people and lepers and uh, came back and uh, ended up on a sailboat and one day in 2005 the phone connected for some reason to some island tower and it rang and it was Al Simpson and he said these guys want to write the story of my life and they don't know me as well as you do would, would you like to take a shot at it? And I said uh, because it was a good life. And I said, just <laughs> I said, just a second now, I'm having trouble getting the cork out of this bottle of Chardonnay. <laughs> but, uh, but I did, and I said, why would I do that? And he said, because I will give you access to everything in my life. Everything. And I, had no, I thought I knew a lot. But all of his records, his papers, his speeches, his personal letters from his family members, it was all there everything that I could possibly want, and especially the diaries. 6,000 pages were the diaries, 19 binders, and people like David McCullough said the reason that these are valuable is that they were put down to these things as they happened. So I was at the White House or talking to Gorbachev uh, or, or Saddam Hussein, and he, put, he took notes, and then he dictated it into this diary that ended up being two Point four million words. Not <laughs> so we set sail for the United States and Al said, uh, how long is this going to take? I said about a year. That was in 2005. <laughs> and I said, but something that's really important. I said, people know that I worked for you and I was loyal to you and you've been my friend for half a century. They're going to expect this thing will be a puff piece. And it's very important that they not think that after they read it. So I said, you know, this it's going to be important that I tell the bad things and the failures in balance along with all the, all the successes. And Al said, look, you just do the right thing by telling the truth. He said, if hair, eyeballs, and teeth land on the floor as a result of telling the truth about me, so be it. I also said that I have to have editorial control. If you write anything in this book, people are not going to think it's, uh, they'll think it's a puff piece. And also, you can't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, I hold the contract for that with the University of Oklahoma Press. So, Al said, say what you want, but make it true. So I did. The first three pages describe what it's like to push a flaming car off a cliff and burn down a house and, and um, shoot enough mailboxes to end up on federal probation. Now, the reason that that's important is that <laughs> it is important <laughs> because this is not a story about politics. Half of you have probably written books about politics. The bill goes here, the bill goes there, it gets passed, it doesn't get passed, people slug it out in the cloakroom, whatever. This is a book about humanity, about a human being. He happened to be a politician. But this is a story about a person who is extremely human, a person who puts um, citizenship ahead of partisanship. And that's why it was important to tell this story. And it goes back to the days in which Republicans and Democrats spoke to each other and respected each other. And it doesn't happen as much anymore, but for example, Al Simpson was a great friend of Ted Kennedy. They spoke very late in, into his life. And um, people didn't know that, and they didn't understand it, in Wyoming especially. 
So there's one little story that I have to tell you that it kind of demonstrates the days in which there was friendship because either one of these guys could get the mic and tell the same exact story. It involves a town meeting in Wyoming. You know where people come in and they raise their hands and they're upset about something. And this raucous meeting is going on and Al's presiding over it and in the door comes Ted Kennedy. And people can't believe it. A guy in the back says, what's this guy doing in Wyoming? Another guy stands up and he says, that Ted Kennedy, he's here in Wyoming. That guy is a horse's ass. Simpson jumps up, runs to the back of the room, grabs the guy, opens the door and throws him into a snowbank. And, and when he comes back in, Kennedy says to him, good heavens, that was magnificent, Al. I had no idea that this was Kennedy country. <laughs> and Al looked at him and said, Ted, it's not. It's horse country. <laughs>